thanks to all of you who come just after lunch and uh, use the chance to fall asleep in the next 45 minutes. Before the meeting, I already said it happened to a few people in the past, so enjoy relaxing 30, 35 minutes. And when the people start, other people start talking again, then it's Q&A and it's time to leave or stay for the next talk. Uh, let me give you a short intro about who am I. I'm a Bosch product manager for Linux and embedded open source. And if you see product management, it doesn't mean I'm no longer a deeply embedded engineer. I mean, deeply embedded is more also anyway the RTOS, not the embedded Linux, but let's discuss about it later. I'm also uh, the chair of the technical steering committee within the ELISA project from Linux Foundation. And I'm also a member of the inaugural advisory board of the Linux Foundation Europe. And in my private time, I'm an open source enthusiast, which also brought me basically to the three positions which I currently have. And uh, there I have a long time with different kind of Linux systems and so on, uh, open source messaging things. And one thing which came across my time, and it's actually not the longest time, it exists very long. So we talk about Apertus, and Apertus exists since 13 years roughly with different names. Uh, it reinvented itself several times, and most of these 13 years I sp didn't spend in a Debian environment. I still spent with, in the Yocto world. But, um, well, there was this coexistence within my business unit and my business area of Bosch with Apertus, and we had to always a great support by the Collabra people, which were supporting us in going this Debian way. And yeah, I give you several elements of this talk, so I would like to set the scene say, why was this actually started? What was the pain or what was the things why people considered uh, from the architectural software architectural team to go with the Debian-based distro or product? What makes a purchase a purchase? What's inside? So how does the infrastructure look like? And I keep it on a quite high level because there's the Apertus org, which is a good starting point to uh, basically read a lot of things, have a lot of guidelines in their descriptions, how decisions were made, what was done. And I also show you some production examples because otherwise you could believe that I just faked everything and there's nothing really in use later on. How you can try it out and yeah, I had no name for that after the experience for the what else comes in there. So there's a what else to say session part. Uh, I will give some information about the CIP project. So I like that there are even some CIP people here. And uh, I would like to also give some time for discussions. Right. Uh, I also have a Pertus and CIP stickers laid on if you're getting so convinced and are still able to come to the stage that uh, I could just pick them up. Shortly setting the scene with the highest level slide. This is from a former colleague of mine. He presented it so often that I just thought it's nice to get it in again. Um, he said, from the automotive environment where we came from, our products were in the past typically done with the SOP. So you have a fire and forget policy. You know they are getting into the market. They are not updated anymore. And we were so much concentrating on things like hardware cost. You focus on your SOP deadline. You look what are differentiating factors. How can I just get something in there? And um, flexibility was a kind of thing like just to think, what is the next generation? But not that more on there, and you were considering what is the lowest risk. So what you didn't have in mind were things like reuse across different platforms, or also the maintenance costs which you have to keep it up and running to do updates. Uh, upstream was always somehow on the agenda, and some people here are actually from companies which did some of the upstreaming work also with Bosch together, also more as the Yocto-based projects. And, um, but this was also something to say, what do we do about this? So this is basically where we came from. We saw a changing trend of connected devices. We saw that a lot of different projects started. And then there was Apertus or the product which came before. So what is Apertus? I don't know where the statement is, if it's on the website or not. I just found it in an old set of slides as well. Um, basically, it's here, a Linux-based distribution. Now we say more construction kit which should say that it's giving you also the ecosystem around this, what, is the what a distribution makes. And it was built for infotainment. For those which are not aware of the word infotainment, it's basically your navigation device in the center of your car in the front dashboard, so where you listen to music and radio and 
plug in your USB stick and so on. And Bosch did this for many, many different products and not everything was aligned. So sometimes the people just started a new project with a new SOC and so on and was the willingness to more commonalize it, find a reuse, find a place, how to have common elements, standard packages involved. And here, this is basically where it gets tailored for industrial needs. And here it says it's based on Debian. Uh, we were partially also on the path of Ubuntu originally in there uh, because they had more update cycles. We found Debian a little bit slow at this time, how they do the uh, major updates, but this changed uh, because we figured out also customers were also not respect expecting more updates. So that's why we are now with fully with Debian. Uh, and we also saw that other parties make use of it. So you will see something about this also later on. We have ARM support for ARM32 and ARM and x86 and ARM64, both are in. Uh, and we also have some kind of SDK cloud service environment. So basically to ease your production. Where does this fit into? Um, the first, of course, is the automotive, but we also checked for other devices. We did some prototyping on a uh, lawnmower. So we may created an IoT smart lawnmower out of it because Bosch also had these kind of products. Actually, not in production. It was more prototyping. Uh, Linux, you can find also in bicycle, for example. But uh, for this strip dome, I guess we used another one. And then also in the bottom, you can see some measurement equipment. So this is something where you or later have also an example. So what does it mean from an ecosystem perspective? Everything you need to know you can find on apertis.org. And a lot of my material is also there. What I like, I said it earlier, is that a lot of decisions are also reported there. So you can also see like how are things happening. The good thing is that there were work products in there where, for example, Bosch did a request also to a Pertis team within Colabra and asked them, can you enable this or that functionality? We have this or that requirement. And what they typically did is they went to a Pertis org and also documenting certain reasons for their decisions, like uh, when we migrated to GitLab, when we run away from Fabricator, uh, where, which certain package were selected, the decision why we went from Ubuntu uh, yeah, from Ubuntu to Debian directly. So these are all things which you find on the web page. And this would be the best time to fall asleep because the rest uh, you can still also read on the web page. <laughs> a central part of Apertis, which is a little bit different to maybe standard things, it's a uh, package-centric approach. What does it mean? Uh, yeah, usually if you're a developer, you want to concentrate on developing your application. And you maybe don't want to do that much with your sources, with building, spend a lot of disk space, hours of building a product. Uh, and this is when 10 years back where there were nothing like an S state in Yocto. So right, it was basically something where we had said, you should have something in. And what you may know from your typical environment is that you come, and this is not really Yocto or Debian thing or so, if you have a set of packages, maybe you figure out, oh, I install another package. I add something. And what could also happen is, even if it's in your, just in your development and you start developing, you're looking, oh, wait, there's this component. I make use of this component. And there's something which is not 100% behaving. And then I start changing something in there, which is actually not my component. And then I bring my component. I integrate it. I bring it into the product. And I miss to inform that I have certain local modifications and some other things, maybe just for some debugging purpose or so on. But at some point of time, you will get a failure by this because you have local modifications. We also saw this when you go with a build. We had a fixed build set done. You go from one developer desk to another developer desk, and things start to behave differently. All right? And then you ask, what have you changed? I changed nothing. And then there's a question, why? when you have changed nothing, why have you compiled it? Uh, yeah, these were the kinds, and this is where we said, oh, we want to have something and we want to steal the power from development by uh, giving them just binaries. This was something which I heard several times, but I mean, it's, you can do other tricks around it, so this is just that. But this is about the packages. And also one concern which came up was like, there are packages which are doing the job, but you may favor maybe another packages which you know from the past or which does the same thing. So you may end up with multiple packages doing the same thing or a similar thing. So this is something where the apertus said we have a set of packages and whenever you want to have something new, you need to make a package request rather than just adding things. And uh, 
this increases also that we have a better reproducibility of the results because of there's all the binaries elements in there. And what we also had was we working a lot with uh, air copyright protected intellectual property things. We have come from the infotainment world. We talk with, uh, for example, with Apple because you need to attach your iPhone. You have Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, their proprietary element in there. And by this, we need to see how do we get through this tag? Where do we play certain libraries which are changing over time to GPL3, for example? Uh, there was a bash time, and I guess many still use bash and may use a bash in the version which is GPLv3, but we replace it with dash, check with scripts, maybe may behave differently or so. So this was done as in work, and the documentation around this is also on the apparatus org. That's why I put the link in there. Uh, yeah, we had the core utils. We replaced it by Rust core utils where fun missing functionalities were in there. We added this. And when I say we, it's basically the people around the apparatus community. So it's not always Bosch, but also with Colabra and others working in there. Um, yeah, GNU GPL was, or GNU PG was one example. And interesting was also when we placed from, uh, from the tar and we went to BSD tar and we later on just figured out that we have some issues if we use containers because there were some functionality actually not in there. So we had to implement this also for BSD tar. So the evaluation was not perfect. And uh, yeah, all these kind of packages, they end up in a package repository. So we keep this under apparatus org and the GitLab instance of it. And we have roughly 70, uh, 7,000 packages in there. And if you uh, yeah, look into the environment um, of 7,000 packages, I guess the Red Hat Enterprise Linux size is roughly 5,000 packages. Uh, for other systems, this is maybe 15,000, 20,000 packages, but this is basically the core where we say this is elements which are used somewhere for some functionality, some maybe also not used, and the later product will be just a smaller subset of it. The things the packages get collected into images and into releases. So uh, you find typically three releases. There's one release under development and two which are running in a regular quarterly base. So currently, uh, I took this from April now. You can see that we have still the maintenance of 23. So the 23 version of it gets a quarterly update. So at the beginning of 23, you will have 23.0, and then it gets dot one, dot two, dot three. 3.4.5 until 7, and after 7, you're at the end of two years. And similar is for 2024. And now we are in the development for 2025, which means uh, it's DAV2. It's a second quarter development. This is currently on the 6.6 .6 kernel. And later during the year, when the next LTS version of the kernel will come toward the end, the real version of the 2025 will be the next LTS kernel version. For packages, we are aligned to the Debian releases, so we jumped there basically, we took look what is the released version and then we migrate this new release version into the development version and bring this forward. So currently most of the things are on Bookworm and I guess maybe, I'm not sure if the 23 is still on Bootsa, but there is a release package list so that you can just see which version of which package are include. Right. Uh, yeah, for kernel, uh, we follow the LTS kernel. So we were also doing more frequent updates of the kernel, but there were customers also saying we don't need more updates than just the releases on the LTS version. And we say that it's yeah, every year we come with a new LTS and we really recommend also all to just migrate every year to a new version of the Linux so that you always stay quite close and don't end up into many, many years of long-term support on a similar kernel version. So with now the CRA changes and the LTS announcement also by Greg Hartman, this was something where we thought, okay, it falls into the pattern which we anyway were doing. So we're not supporting any kernel longer than two years currently. All right, that's on this. Uh, I put this table in here. So this is basically showing how these things are, what I just mentioned. So if there is a certain quarter, can we see, let me see if I get my mouse from where? You can see here are the development steps. And then there is a pre-release after Dev3, and it goes on then with a .0, .1, and so on. So we have a total three years for one version of Apertus. And then uh, it ends. And this gives you also on the right, you can see here you have two 
years of overlap, so you can really time while you are on this one. Maybe for production, you can change over for your next update on the development and then move on so that you have continuously updates on the different version. You may have different ideas on how you want to update based on if you are in a pre-production phase, then you may be more aggressive, changing just the version from one to the other, so you can live a little bit faster. But with the production phase, you always have a year for preparation to change to a new kernel version, and then another year. And the nice thing is that you typically either change the kernel version first, or you change a Debian version. So the most issues come with kernel version updates, typically, even if there is not too much dependent these days. But uh, so you have issues with the kernel version update, less issues with the security path in there. But um, it basically gives you the time and gives an argumentation how to go forward. And all these releases get tested. So you can find test results on QA or Paratus Org. Uh, there are A for automatic tests. There are manual test suites also executed. Uh, I hate this QA app tool thing, which is in there. So I never find myself really comfortable in finding logs and so on. But basically, you get an impression. It's also not including all test cases, because there are a bunch of test cases in there um, which are just coming from packages. They are also in included during the CI phase, but they are not reported. So we do some pre-integration testing, which would mean uh, you have a package. There's a change in the package. The package itself comes from upstream and brings upstream testers. If the test fails, it will never make it into the release. So this is something uh, where, say, if soon as a package unit test level fails, you don't get it mainland or with just significant exceptions, but uh, normally this doesn't work. So you see basically extended testing in the QA, rep QA report. And uh, yeah, we have different variants with apt and OS tree. With apt mean you can have the apt package manager on your target and then just install new packages. It could be in your virtual box image or also while you're developing. Later on, if you move on in production, we typically remove the package manager because you should have a stable package version and just provide OS tree updates. Right, uh, a reference parts I already mentioned. What's nice is that we just recently had the uh, new TI chipset available. So this is version 2025. It's just coming. The first releases are in. And this is the Tara platform because there are new products really asking for it. And what I also like a lot is that we have the STAK tasks on the QAMO, so it gets some additional testing when you done it is for the development phase, not for the production. The test lab looks a little bit like this. So this is the Colabra Lava test farm. Uh, I figured out that also some CIP testing results were also executed there, and also that the CIP test, Lava test also uh, did kernel CI testing on Apertus and so on, so it's very nice about this. It's connected to kernel CI. And over this, yeah, the whole Apertus infrastructure, it's very few things which are really more or less tailored, glued. It's a lot of really looking into open source environment tools. We were using Fabricator. It's in the top right corner for project management things, issue trapping, and so on. But uh, this was deprecated, so we moved on. You find the details also described why we moved away from it on the Apertus org side how we came to the new, what was main drivers for it. So also these kind of managerial decisions are put in. Uh, we have robot framework support, but I don't know too many robot framework test cases in there. Uh, yeah. We had update on Potman. Potman was an interesting story because Potman is in this very fast development pace still. So uh, if you look in there, we are on an older version of Potman currently because with the latest version of Potman, we had so many package dependencies that we really got conflicts with the uh, Debian bookworm release. So it was so much behind that we need to make a trade-off in the version. I guess we're now in version 3 or something like this for Potman. And with Potman, we also figured out that there were some uh, BSD tar issues which we had to solve. Right. The whole infrastructure, um, here basically we start from sources. And what's interesting here is we take the Debian sources and we create Debian package out of it again. So we're not directly taking Debian binaries. Uh, we also add BSP parts from vendors in there and proprietary sources because not everything may be open source, which ends up in your product. So it gets into the uh, GitLab instance. We have also 
private product instances where you don't see this. So if you build a product on it, you may not want to unveil your Google or Apple source codes or whatever comes in or your something where what you claim as differentiating IP. So we have this as an environment, but you can also just have the open view on this. Then it gets things built, some part may be binary, which you don't need to pour, put in a repository like GPU drivers and so on. The binaries get patched and then you have the targets afterwards. Yeah, it's of course cross-compiled. I just mentioned it because recently some of my colleagues started just do native compiling on PCs and say this is much cooler than the rest. Yeah, updates and so on. Uh, the Apertus folks also told me that this is the better representation of it. It basically is the same part as here, but I found there were too many connections, so I just put it in the slide set. So if you later on look into it, you can see what follows from where to where, how the flows are. And then we would go for the experience section. Uh, my favorite product is the Bosch Power Tools. It's uh, DTAC 200. 200 means this is a wall scanner which can go 200 millimeters inside a wall with radar technologies or whatever it is. And they can just scan and see, is there some electric, is there some wires, some pipes, whatever could go in there. And it also tells you in which distance they are. Um, for our markets in US, Europe, and most part, they are on a, I think on a five centimeter accuracy or something like this. And in Japan, there, is, there are regulations which need to guarantee how thick the wall need to be in millimeters before there, the uh, iron grid comes, which you typically put into the side. And in Japan, this is an actual measurement equipment where it's going on the millimeter level accuracy with it. So there's much more, but for the normal grade, this is not needed. Um, yeah, and the Bosch Power Tools are a subsidiary of Bosch, and they were new because before they were doing microcontroller environment, and they suddenly need to have something more powerful with an HMI and so on, and they figured out, okay, let's look for some low-level hardware, so it's uh, really more an entry device level, and they saw that they get good support also on uh, from the apparatus team from the infotainment side, so they are there, and why did they do so? They are a team of 10 to 20 people, and they didn't want to bother a lot with selecting the right packages. They said, we don't want to set up our own CI, we better rely on something where we have, and we want to have a focus on our application development. And uh, these are the great promoters of it. And they also make heavy use of uh, virtual box images for it. So that's basically for their pre-development activities and help them also a lot of times. So this is how the virtual box image looks like. They have a cute based are here this and for how should I say the simulation basically if you look at it it looks very similar so all the elements are in there this is the environment where you can just click on it and it behaves like the actual device and what I found really cool was that they also have the measurement data in there so when we had the COVID-19 starting they all went into home office and what they did was there's from time to time, there was a person going into the office and recording new walls with raw data from the sensor. And then they just had the raw data recording, put it into the virtual box image, and they could just continue developing. And the nice thing was the packages which you have in, they are exactly the one which you see on the target. The behaviors, very similar. I, I don't say identical. It's nearly identical, but still that one is an ARM environment, one is an x86 environment, right? So it's not 100% accurate, but like this. And this is what is one benefit. So they are much faster in their developing when they have they don't, and the hardware, they have very small numbers and not so they cannot afford to create too much sample hardware. So this helps. And uh, here, I mean, this is was what I always heard from simulation environments where it's beneficial. I was still asking for what, where is another selling point on this? And they told me that they have deeply embedded developers, which really work typically on microcontroller level. They really just check directly on algorithms. But these algorithms, which are on the other device categories where they are developed on the mass production part also, they bring these into the apertus environment for the higher level premium devices. And for this, maybe it's twice to four times a year where they need to change something into in the algorithm, doing updates, doing better performance or so. 
at this time, they download the VirtualBox image, they start a Linux environment, they make sure that the things compile there, they simulate what they have tested in there, and then they give it to someone else who just put in a package. And this lowers the barrier for a lot of them who come from the deeply embedded space say, I don't want to get around all these. I want to do my make things and I want to try things out. And that's what they directly can do in there. And this helped them a lot to just get away from these confusing parts. So that was the reason for it. And yeah, another device, this is not from Bosch. There was just recently also a uh, news on this, and it was showcased during the Embedded World last week, was from the Atari VCS. This was also a product which uses our apparatus, infrastructure, elements, tools. They don't give full insights what's all in there. It basically just says it uses the apparatus parts in there. Uh, it's doing it since some time. So, and maybe you consider to buy one apparatus uh, Atari VCS system. It has a lot of other features, of course, in there as well. So you can find Western, Wayland, uh, Chrome Browser, Rust. I also just named it to see what kind of features are also in there, what libraries you can find within the purchase. So basically what you normally need for your development. And what I also really like, uh, this is since 2021, you can actually use the Raspberry Pi imager and find a purchase there since 2021. So there's even a low entry uh, way into it. So if you're new, if you are forced maybe to use a Windows environment, or if you are uh, not directly want to download and you're used to DDing your image on the SD card or whatever, you can just go with the standard Raspberry Pi imager and gets in there. And th I think it's support for Raspberry Pi 4. I don't know if it's also for the older version, but also Colabra confirmed that they continue their support on this for the next year so that they also make sure that things get tested and properly working and in case there are issues that they respond to it. Yeah, this is on the apertus part in the Raspberry Pi where you can try out. And we come to the last part of it. What else to say? Uh, I would like to put a spotlight on the CIP project because while apertus is there, it's under no foundation. It's not, it's basically and mainly driven by Collabra and Bosch, and it's all open source, but it's no governance around it, and so you could say what happens if people go out. Uh, with the CIP project, we also find something on an industrial grade level in the Debian space, Debian world. From Bosch, we also became a member of the CIP project. Uh, one major difference with the CIP platform compared to what we have with Apertus is, I guess, the lifetime of the kernel. While we also work on products which work for 10 to 20 years or so, the CIP project also has longer expectations on keeping the products running. And they also have certain, certain certification which may require to be on a version where updates getting harder. So this is something where we have a slightly different approach, but as CIP also goes for mainline first part and then just backport the things on the LTS and super long-term supports parts. This is something uh, where we see a strong correlation, the activities. Um, the CIP has a very set of core packages and a little bit of extended packages, and then the rest need to come from use. It's also very similar to what we have from the ideas. And I guess it's, it's always important to see where do the ideas are comparable. You do not find your 100% solution, but you find a lot of space where you can collaborate in. And um, that's what we have. The lava testing was really great, and we figured out that uh, I think one, one effect was that we are now porting the squad from, uh, from the Linaro team also as a reporting tool while we still stick with Apertus on the QA app because it's settled and bound to the infrastructure. That's something where we have still in parallel lava testing, package hardening, and so on. And yeah, also what's in there if you're not convinced about a pure Debian environment and you still would like to play around and take some Yocto elements, or you feel better comfortable with it. Uh, the build tooling, in the CIP project, it's called ESAR for Integration System for Automated Root File System Generation. Uh, it's basically driven by uh, IBIS, a German company, and Siemens. Siemens also sponsoring it. And yeah, it's there to bootstrap the Demium based system. You can customize things, create firmware images, basically all the things which you can also do with an apertus, but more related. And the ESAR uses CAS, which is then the meter tooling underneath, and this is running then on bitbake layers and bringing the whole thing into the environment. 
I don't do a too long explanation on this because uh, you can hear a lot of things from the depth conf. <laughs> so, and basically I took some of the information from the presentation there and also from what's in the docs of GitHub, so therefore you find your input part here. One thing which I also want to mention, uh, I showed a lot of things on this little changes, mixing of systems and so on, and this is basically there to say, if you see some rooms for improvement, there's also always a challenging part and find your way and what makes your things best. And you all see it when you look into your, down to your keyboard, when you start programming, maybe some of you have already changed something. I still do hard and changing to new. I always want to do it since a long time, but I stick with my used layout, keyboard layout, even seeing the benefits. And what I want to mention is the old typewriter patent from 1868 was created to have these mechanical shifts while typing that these different levers do not block while typing. So they were optimized for a mechanical typewriting, not blocking thing. They were not optimized for language. And if you would optimize something for the language you write in, you can see this color coding, and this is the color coding from the new. And there is also uh, the Dvorak part, there are alternatives in there, so a lot of layouts with multi-layers, also better for programming. Uh, yeah, and the, the smallest part is that you have the, also the art 30 or the quartz with that instead of the Y for the German part, for example, and uh, I find this a very nice thing so that you should always change just because you have a very spread solution or a very mature solution, existing long-term solution, sometimes it's good to challenge just say, is this really the best solution? And what elements are maybe somewhere sorted out elsewhere? What can I improve? Where can I change things? And these can be challenges like say, well, I know that I am taking certain uh, there are products which are running on a long time. What do I do with my packages? Can I really just go with the mainline kernel? What are my requirements? What can I change? What can I not change? Of course, you would, if you're still using a mechanical typewriter, changing the keyboard layout will be a waste of time because you're running in an environment where you need to do it. If you change to something else, it could be something to consider. Uh, other things which we had were the 100 plus SOPs. Uh, the good was a common infrastructure cost project. People find themselves welcome or familiar, even if they change a product, a project, or a platform, an SOC type, and so on. And what I also think was one of the challenges was I learned once from an integrated or assigned who was always changing the binary part after compilation manually for a certain thing which he figured out. And he went on vacation. And we were wondering why the build didn't work anymore properly. And we said, it, it's, something is strange. What has he done? There's something missing in the documentation. And then we figured out, they said, yeah, of course, whenever I do this, I change this binary directly because there's a flaw in the binary. So it doesn't mean if you go for binary, you're done. Uh, but that's also when you have control about sources, it's even easier to change something and so on. So this was something which we also had a challenge in there to say, how do we avoid this last mile changes? And if we are start and do the CI system and say, we only accept the CI, being fully automated, it's much harder to do later on some checks. And if there's a fully automated flow until the testing, which we have, and this really helps you also to avoid that you have local modification from single persons. And by this, uh, I encourage also to solve challenges together in which products, however, if you become a Debian fan over time, if you try things out, reach out. We're still looking also to bring this into an environment like a foundation also, so that's something which we would also consider from a purchase side, but it's, I know it's also not easy to get something forward and it's nicer to solve problems together than getting a solution with a solved problem. By this, I would like to include, say thank you. I just see two people over time who almost fall asleep. So that's very good. And uh, yeah, if there are questions, let me know. Lift your arm off the question. I have a mic here. I may also be able to repeat the question. So. Any questions in the last, yes, we have five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe. Yeah, Drew, you want to use a microphone and hand it over? 
So I, I saw that uh, you listed OS tree and then uh, package-based stuff for uh, updates during yeah. development. Uh, do you have a plan for in, you know production level uh, over the air updates for this setup? Yeah. So there are production level updates on the OS tree, and we also implemented ROG, but the ROG part is not officially supporting the apparatus yet. I don't know if it will come or not. There we had a long discussion because there is already something and does it serve, what is the better solution and so on. So you never know, there could also be a software update part from the CIP which could be taken over, but we had some customers which wanted to use ROG and then we said, okay, we get a ROG in and they were said, no, we will not change and say, okay, that's the point where you start with two and where you break with your rule of keeping one, preferably. Yeah. Maybe Drew, you can hand over. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, my question is about the, the licensing aspect that you, you yeah. saw. So there were, you replaced Bash <coughs> with Dash. Uh, can you explain what, what is the motivation behind uh, avoiding particular licenses? Yeah, I mean, if you have a GPL v3 strong copyleft license, you need to change and you need to open source could you need to uh, give away also tool chain, the reproduction parts of it. And this is sometimes really tricky and hard to really fulfill the demands when you have closed environments where you're actually not allowed at all to share anything. The hardest restriction which we had was on a tool where we are just allowed to provide the results of the tool execution when the other company has exactly the same version license of the tool. This was really strange. There was some, some analysis debugging tool to set and this was a very proprietary one. And it was really said, okay, we wanted to show the debugging results to another party so the results of the tool, and they said you are only allowed to share these results when they have a license with the exact same version of the tool. And in this environment with Apple and so on, we said the easiest way is to see where can we get away of certain copyleft activities. Not that we don't like it. What we also did is uh, the same thing is we were commercializing certain things. So if you go, uh, we have not for the Apertis part directly, but in the Apertis environment, we were also using Wolf SSL and they have a commercial license and a non-commercial license. You saw the Qt in there. There's also commercial license. If I'm correct, I, I'm not in the Power Tools people side. So there's also then that there's the commercial license used rather than the fully open one. So, so um, this would be a carrot for any commercial product developer to use a Pertis because it kind of guarantees that copyleft uh, copy license uh, components are not part yeah, yeah. So, so you said this would be the current. I just repeat before the virtual audience. So you said it would be a current to take this for product developers because they can make sure that nothing on from a strong copy left is in there. Uh, yeah, but of course you also tie in then in an environment, right? It's it's your choice. You get a pre-checked environment. Actually, this was a feedback which I got when I went to Embedded World last year. I was presenting a product there at the Bosch booth. And there were a lot of, lot of small, middle-sized enterprise there which said, that's really great because we know licenses thing is there, you have the CI, we know it's running in product, Bosch has a certain name, it's a brand, we know that it gets stability and it releases a lot of pains from us. Uh, so we would be, ha they were quite happy to hear about a purchase. And the nice thing is, I mean, you can use it as it is and you can also buy a commercial plan and you can buy a commercial plan for your product support either from Colabra or also from Bosch side. Uh, while we, from Bosch, of course, often also look into larger size customers because it depends, but also the power tool guys with 15 people from inside, they also are the customer inside Bosch and not directly with Colabra, yeah. Okay. So I, I work in Yachtra Project a lot, um, but I've also worked in ICER and, and costs yeah. a lot. And so I saw that you put that up there. So thinking, I'm guessing, if I just simply took ISAR and pointed at the a purchase package feed, I am building a purchase now or something you close. Ex so yeah, it's... Um, Cause it's not gonna be the DevOS tool or whatever, however you say the tool. No, you, you can also, you can also go to the sources there and get these sources. Um, it could be like when we create a new product, we do a cross check. We have the 7,000 packages and we looked into some more detail, not, and when we get a product configuration, now there's a product build, we do a cross check that things are really are as they are. Um, if you have an own CI, but exactly this is a use case which we also have inside Bosch where 
Uh, there's a lot of other units also which make use of Yocto, of course. And for some, they said, okay, what really brings out the benefit is are the Debian sources. And therefore, they just pull in the Debian sources from a purchase and use the standard Yocto toolchain. Yeah, because for those who don't know, with ICER, you can still write a recipe that's still a bit-bake recipe. So yeah. now you can build some new yep. vertical, vertical, um, vertical stack, you know, value-add software yeah. with recipes and not have to learn everything about Debian packaging necessarily. Exactly. I mean, it's the thing, if you're completely new to the environment, if you haven't built Linux-based product, then it could be a start, you could have a free choice, but if you're settled in Debian completely and move Debian things to Yocto fully, the path may be a little bit faster because you can just say, okay, I, I take my, my sources, but I think from both directions. If you're used to a certain environment, it's very hard to go to a new environment. Like we saw with the keyboard also, right? If you are typing since a long time and you feel very good with it, to learn the new tool, it will always take. So you cannot simply swap to a new Adorax setup. So this is, even if it's better for your, or it solves some of your problems, it doesn't mean that you will really do, maybe do another training or just do some addition. So yeah, and that's why, I mean, you need to find the solution. So the thing I was very interested in was the emulation, the emulated product. Um, Cause I had worked on a team where we, had test-driven development yeah. <clears throat> using um, MinGW, right? So we we were actually compiling and running in an emulated environment six months before we had any hardware. PCB yeah. layout wasn't yeah. even done yet, and we had run all of this testing. So I think that was really intriguing. I'm wondering how much of that could you know be common tool chains or you know tools to create these virtual environments and so on, so yeah. that we could all benefit from that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that would be something useful. I guess that's also what's coming now more with the software-defined vehicle topics around from the automotive world, which I'm familiar most with, where they also say we can shorten the cycles without not having hardware yet, but getting closer to simulations, getting things with having ARM servers because a lot of things are ARM-based, yeah. Right, I guess we need to wrap up. Uh, my official time is over since two or three minutes, and I guess there will be a next speaker. So normally there's someone holding a QA stop but I guess there is no stop sign today, so I will just stop here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> most likely. All right, then, uh, here, I said already, thanks. Reach out to me if you want a sticker. Uh, stay here. I guess I will go to the hallway to not bother more people. And thanks a lot for your participation.